could come back after lunch. You already uh, came back after lunch. But you get for a really good treat in a moment or two. It's a treat for me to be introducing our distinguished next speaker, Wendy Horn, who is a change lever of note. As is customary for something like this, the speaker will send through all of the bios and CVs for the introducer to, to refer to. But I went to Facebook <laughs> to find out a little bit more about Wendy. When you don't have to worry about page 12. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the first things, and that's actually where I stopped reading, one of the first things I came across was this. A quote by Lisa Romano. If we expect students to be kind, we need to be kind adults. If we expect students to be cooperative, we need to be cooperative adults. If we, need, if we expect students to be responsible, then we need to be responsible adults. Model, 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 model. And I thought that resonates. Because it's a demanding subject, 21st century schools, <clears throat> right at the heart of it for the people in those classrooms. Wendy will be known to many of us in the room, but even if that is the case, her impressive CV is well worth summarising, although I don't think I can really do it justice. Her teaching career started at Park Town Girls High, Kauten. She then saw the light and came down to Cape Town, <laughs> where she taught at Sandlers for a while, becoming deputy principal, and in 2014 she was appointed head at Protea Heights. She has been the chief marker and inter internal moderator of physical science, the chemistry paper, She's authored a number of grade 10 to grade 12 textbooks for Oxford University Press, and she's co-authored a digital physical science platform on Zoom. And an English and French teacher, much respect for all of that, really. Her lectures and educational management at the University of the Western Cape have impacted greatly on numerous principals, deputies, and department heads. And currently, Wendy is the WCED Director of the Metropole North District, a position <coughs> in which her passion for education has had a positive impact since 2020 and continues to do so. Her weight is more. She's won two national awards, Excellence in Science Education in the years 2013-2014 and Excellence in Secondary School Leadership in guess what years, 2019 and 2020. Her weight is more. As if these accomplishments were not enough, Wendy was selected as one of the top 50 teachers in the world in the Global Teacher Prize in 2018. <laughs> Wendy, thank you so much, not only for what you're about to share with us and your time here today, but for your massive contribution to the lives of our country's young people and its educational leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, Okay, good afternoon everybody uh, and thank you for coming back after lunch. We just get this apple thing to work. Okay. Um, so the bio seems impressive, but um, I think one thing I want to, to say uh, is this is that one, I never intended being a teacher, and somehow I fell into it because I got a bursary and they cracked me for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, so here I am, uh, a teacher, uh, and somehow I ended up being regular teacher on the first slide. <laughs> somehow. Um, okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay, thanks. And so I ended up uh, becoming a teacher through a Funza bursary, and I was trapped. And I actually wanted to become a scientist. That's my first passion, and still is a passion of mine. And so I did science teaching. And throughout my career, never aspired to be a principal or anything like that. I just loved what I did. I loved teaching. I loved children. And now I'm here on the dark side of things. I miss my classroom every day. I miss the children the most every day. I miss talking nonsense in the classroom. As you all know, it's, best, it's the absolutely best place um, to be. So Greg came to me and said I need to talk about 21st century classrooms and I thought four years ago I would have been very passionate about this as a principal. Now I'm on this side of the fence and all I know is, uh, maybe I should start with this disclaimer because all the North principals are looking at me, no, I don't have any mobiles, no, I don't have any posts in my pockets and yes, I do have all the children for you to place. Uh, so, so you become jaded and um, you know, the problem just seems so insurmountable, and we're talking 21st century schools, but we have schools with 
Well, it would be mobile since, I don't know, 20 years ago. We have schools, as you said, with no internet. We have schools who are essentially feeding 1,400 kids twice a day. Um, and where do we fit all the 21st century stuff into, into that? You know, 1% of the schools in North are fee-paying schools. Yet 80% are point on four schools. So the disparities are just massive. And so in all of this, to become a 21st century school, my only advice to the principal, I can say, or a couple of advice is one, as a principal, you need to hustle. You need to hustle. Like my principal is now hustling me while I'm there with tears in your pocket. I need this, all these things fixed. They were hustling. And you know what? I respect that hustle. Please, you need to hustle. You need to go out there. You need to make things happen. It's not going to happen if you don't hustle. As I said to the people, you need to ask. And you need to ask them nag and beg and fight. That's your job. But my job is to divide out the one mobile between 20 schools. But that's your job. <laughs> Second thing is, as principals, as 21st century schools, you must manage your school. Please stop phoning the district office. We have no clue what to do. We pretend to know what to do. But you know what to do. Manage your school. You are in charge of your school. You manage your school. And in that management, be agile. You have to be agile. We can't be doing the same things we do every day and say, hope it's going to change. Einstein says that's the definition of madness. Be agile. And most of my towns of schools, if you want to call them that, are agile. I know today there's no water, tomorrow's no electricity, there is a fight and a riot, the taxis are blocking, and they are agile. I, I, I appeal to my SMLC schools, everything was, you've got your year plan to set for the next 10 years. Please throw that in away. Be agile. Okay, things change so fast in education. And maybe lastly, before I move into this, um, don't be afraid to fail. As principals, we are scared to fail because it makes us vulnerable to our staff. You know what? Failure is awesome. It's because the only way we learn. You don't learn when you are successful. Sometimes you're successful by accident, and you know you'll be successful again because you don't really learn anything from it. But you need to be able to fail. So agile, fail, hustle. Okay? Um, the best principles are the best hustlers. That's what I've picked up. So please um, do those things. And so how do you get to be a 21st century school when um, you have all these constraints? You know, and you're under-resourced as a department. Uh, so I actually did this exercise putting into chat GTP. What is a 21st century school? Because I couldn't actually do this topic when Greg came to me. And I said, you know, it's a modern building. I thought, no, that's not going to happen. Technology integration. No, that's definitely not special. You can't answer your cell phone because there's no uh, internet. Uh, must be personalized. I thought, yeah, I've got 57 kids in the grade 7 class. I don't know how they're going to personalize that. But anyway, um, collaboration. Okay, collaboration. That can happen. We can collaborate. Okay, with each other, within the class, with the teachers, etc. So I'll expand about that. Creative. I just said about that. Hustle. You've got to be creative. So what if you don't have internet? What if you don't have devices? You know, uh, how many of you are Google registered uh, school and are using Google Classroom to interact with your learners? Yeah. And some of you are, some of you are there, but that's one percent of the schools. So how do the rest of the schools get their learners ready to be 21st century citizens? The fourth industrial revolution and all these big words. We wanted to talk about 21st century education. We are looking through an educational revolution. The pace of change is staggering. Schools, regions, entire countries are turning education on its head and redefining the experiences of students and of teachers. The impact is felt by millions of children and their families around the world. Let's consider for a moment the world in which they live. A world with so much knowledge it's hard to grasp. People are creating 2,000 new websites every hour. They are uploading 35 hours of video every minute and watching 2 million YouTube videos every day. By the time they leave school, teenagers average nearly 1,000 Facebook friends. They connect with people thousands of miles away as if they were in the same room. They consume, produce, and communicate information in previously unimaginable ways. They truly are the children of a globalized world. And where are they here as they grow up? To a hyper-connected world with more people and fewer resources. But this 
sick of any of all full of uncertainties. A workforce that is more mobile and better qualified than ever before. And careers that span multiple jobs, positions and skill sets, some of which haven't been invented yet. In response, education leaders are making big changes, building 21st century skills, using enabling technologies, and personalizing learning to engage students in diverse and creative ways. In South Korea, schools are switching to digital textbooks, so students can study anytime and anywhere, with online hours recognized as school attendance. In Denmark, students are using the internet while taking exams. They can access any site they like, even Facebook, as long as they don't message each other or use email. In the USA, ultra-personalized learning approaches allow students to create their own individual schedules. Their interests and performance are locked down to generate playlists of learning options, with teachers time ready to mentor and supervise students. Learning can happen anywhere and everywhere. That's why some Australian schools are pushing learning beyond school walls, where internships with local organisations are a fundamental part of each student's learning plan. Distance learning programs are connecting seriously disengaged students with online learning communities and personal mentors to help them rediscover their love for learning. The opportunities for 21st century education are immense. These examples point the way to ensuring that tomorrow's workers, parents and citizens are more creative problem solvers, better communicators and lifelong learners. To make sure that change happens on a massive scale, we need to make big changes. That's why we've designed a new Australian curriculum online, supported by interactive, constantly updated digital resources, structured around students and teachers' needs. And it's why we now have national professional standards for teachers and principals that make sure they need them. Just copy the slides today. 
So that's what you did. You know, we copied these slides down the whole lesson. What did she learn? And she's at a really good school and we get really good results. But copying slides, how is that going to be a 21st century school? Rather take them outside, if you're going to do NS and you want them to learn about, I don't know, biodiversity, instead of copying down 50 definitions, let them go outside. There's a whole field of grass and stuff where they can learn in a creative, collaborative, together, creative way, problem solving way. <coughs> But there's the crux, I think, why it doesn't happen in our schools. Because it's a hell of a lot of work for the teacher. You need to plan, you need to take everything down to the nth degree, because you know those children, as soon as you let them go outside, it's not. <laughs> if you don't have a plan, you don't know, you're fooling around, those children are just going to go berserk. Even your best children or your worst children. So it takes a lot of planning, and it takes practice. The first time you do it, you're probably going to fail. The kids are going to go berserk. And the answers you're going to get, you're going to think, what the heck? I'm never going to do that again. Go back to chalk and talk and copy the slides. So you need to take it. You need to do it. You need to fail. You need to refine it. You need to go do it again and fail again until you get it right. And you need to somehow take the principle. And the chaos you see going on there is actually the learning that is happening. Because they're going to also come. I remember when I was principal at Project Arts Academy, we had a lot of outdoor classrooms. Um, <coughs> We did a lot of outdoor type of um, learning, and I would walk out, stomp, 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 stomp. What's that noise? I'm trying to work. And I was learning at the end, uh, okay, go back inside, close the window, so that I could, I could work. Because learning in this way is noisy, it's crazy, it's chaos, it's controlled chaos, but it's chaos. And that's how the learners learn. In, the, in that video, they also said kids have access to how many thousand websites, they watch so many videos, I mean, TikTok, I mean, if you were a teenager, you'll know TikTok is the uh, way to go, they probably watch about 300 videos a day on TikTok. They can multitask, they think they can multitask, but they do, they, there's hundreds of things going on at any given time. And then you bring them into a classroom where they're going to concentrate on one thing, forget it. We are so boring, people. <laughs> hey, okay. I don't want to go back to school, it's out of boring. School is boring. I mean, I'm, I'm ADHD and school is boring. I will never make it in a classroom. So I think we need to be innovative in how we take that CAPS document and interpret what must be done in that document. Okay? Um, then, so, so, so classroom, my, my topic initially was classroom by design. How do we design our classrooms and our school space? to allow for this 21st century learning to take place. Especially when we don't have internet and computers and all the fancy stuff, personalized learning. How do we design? And the, if you take a look at the 1890s, the, I think most of our classrooms still look like that, eh? Rows of desks, right? Windows on the one side of the wall. Nobody can see the whiteboard because it's so bright in there, you have to wear shades. Uh, and that's what our classrooms are because us, many of our schools were built hundred years ago or so. Then uh, they changed the design of the classrooms at one point and tried to make it more inclusive with uh, you know, little clusters of desks looking at each other, um, different types of learning spaces, more group work. And then I remember I was part of that when I was still a young teacher, group work came in and actually had to group work and I thought, oh, I'm a science teacher, we like to sit in the labs in straight lines and I was what must I do to get group work going? And it's a nightmare because, you know, my saying about group work, my own personal saying, is um, please let the people that I do group work with, uh, with lower me into my grave so they can let me down one more time. And so, just group work for me doesn't work. And for learners, it's hard because one person doesn't work and the rest get the marks and it's a fight with the parents and I know. And so the group work came out and we designed our classrooms, these little clusters, and in the group at the back with nothing they were just chatting to each other and whatever. And so the design uh, then changed to more multi-purpose places where we have maybe places where kids can do group work, places where they can sit their desks, and the foundation-based classrooms are good design of this. You have your mats, and you have the place where the kids can sit at desks, and you might have another place where they are making art type of things. So that is the, the, the foundation phase um, design, which seems to work very well. Our results in the foundation phase, the systemic and everything, are so much better than our grade six results. And then the grade result, nine results are losing wait till they come out, you're going to cry. Um, but then the question is why is it going so well in the foundation phase? What happens at grade four, five, and six that it goes south? Well, maybe it's the design of how 
we do things in our classroom. Because if we go from the foundation program, these different areas where kids can use creativity, they can do group work, and they can do individual work, and they get individual attention on the mat. We now go sitting rows, or sitting in the clusters, and work on your own. And every now and then you'll work in a group, which, which is not actually a group, because only one person will do the work, and the rest of us watch. Um, so we need to think about our design of our classrooms. And now we've got a, a mix of things happening in our classrooms, uh, but the spaces in our classrooms don't necessarily always give rise to us doing this multi-purpose different areas in our classroom. If you've got a, a mobile of 60 square meters with 57 kids in it, you don't have much maneuverability within that classroom. What you do have outside of the classroom. Okay? Um, I've got a picture here of a science lab, which is designed by UWC, and they put these labs in with different types of working areas for the, the kids. Um, uh, it has a, in the middle, it has a sort of, what's the thing called, the lazy, what's it, your lazy, something other than the pseudo mats, where you can turn it around the chemicals move, which is a great idea in practice, but in, uh, a great idea in theory, not in practice, because those kids, that looks like them, and those chemicals <laughs> go, and the science teacher is good nerve wracking. Um, and now we're moving in our design of schools and classrooms to more sustainable classrooms. So now we've got, uh, you know, solar panels, inverters, connecting rainwater, JoJo tanks with, uh, they zero many schools now, JoJo tanks, they use the water to flush your toilets, etc. And we're connecting our, our rainwater and getting to a more sustainable type of classroom. Um, so, classroom design. I put a disclaimer in here, because I tried to find some research to tell us what actually works. And you will find so many <coughs> conflicting ideas about how you should put your classroom together and your um, content together in order to create this 21st century learning space for the learners. And why is that? It's because each learner is an individual. Each learner has their own individual learning style. Some like group work, some like me, actually hate group work. Uh, others are on the autistic spectrum, they see things and they learn differently at a different pace. You know, others want to work with their hands, they actually just don't want to do anything that doesn't involve doing something. And so, we somehow in our classroom need to create a space, design it so that each learner within obviously a constraint has a space or a moment in time in the day where they can learn in their style where we can bring out this um, critical thinking in their style of learning. Difficult, but something to think about when you go back to a classroom tomorrow. I had a math teacher when I was um, principal. Uh, you know, we had to see, must put these posters up in your classroom. And I had very young teachers, and it was almost like a competition, cutthroat competition, whose classroom was going to be the best at the beginning of each year. Yeah, they spent money. I mean, I mean, they had no money, these young teachers, but they would spend posters, paint for our back. Nobody can paint in classroom. That's a rule in the school. And I come back and the classroom will be painted. And I was like, every time we paint the classroom, the classroom gets smaller, you know, that, right? <laughs> and, but I had one teacher who refused to put up a single poster. And the speaker advised to go crazy, because I mean, that's part of your ticklers, because they're posters in classroom, and I can be seen. And he just refused. And because he was autistic himself, he was an IT math teacher, and he said, these posters distract the learners. When I teach, I want them to be focused on me and on what we are doing. The other stuff around you, the things that hang from the roof and whatever, distract the learners. So he didn't have a single thing. There wasn't a single piece of paper in his classroom, except it was on the desk of the child. Different thing, but I think it had, uh, because we were a massive science folks school, I did draw a lot of learners that were slightly on the autistic spectrum and different ways of learning. We had one who would talk to himself and eat lunch, but I had all sorts of characters. And they thrived in their classroom. They loved it. They weren't distracted. Those boys that did IT and met with him thrived. Because he spoke in his monotone, because Apple was boring at all, and it's like an IT person. I wonder if this is a bit more exciting in here. So now I, I'm ADHD, I need the distraction. Um, and he, but he got the best results out of those children in the way that he made them work. Eventually, he had them working collaboratively with we Google Classroom. Working on Google Classroom, you bring up a slide and we can then work together on one slide. And because these kids were on all this situation, they want to talk to each other, but they didn't mind working together on the slide because they didn't have to look at each other or know who was writing what or such. 
and it gave you more confidence as words and make it interact um, more. So you need to, in your design of how you're going to teach collaboration, critical thinking skills and creativity, you need to look at your learners you have and what resources you have ahead and do the best that you can with those resources you have. So, what can we do? If you're going to work independently to catch up, you'll actually turn the tables toward that wall. If you're going to collaborate, you're going to be at this table, or you're going to be at this table. All right? Go. By differentiating in a space that's small or where you have a lot of students, we are able to set students up with the learning situations in which they can learn best. wide range of students and so you'll see a varying degree of skill within an academic classroom. Providing flexible space gives students the opportunity to learn in different ways and it also gives the teacher the opportunity to coach them properly in a personalized manner to reach their learning goals. If you guys want to work independently, what is going to be the best place and the best people to be next to you to work independently? Those who want the mini lesson are going to come to this table. We provide a lot of flexibility for learning environments, whether it's flexibility in terms of a physical space, flexibility in terms of the different choices that students have. You see students seated toward the back of the room. Those students are working independently. The students who are at the tables have chosen to collaborate, which is something they thought through and made part of the goal setting. And then you have the group of students that chose one of the two mini lessons, and that takes place in the center of the classroom. Is it important to have more white paragraphs or Sometimes. A student will write a better thesis in the conclusion than they do at the opening because they had a chance. We wanted to elaborate because we've been having each other on the steps that we had to do, and especially since they're so long, we kind of thought, oh, we should work together. Also, I think if we were to be at other tables, we might be more distracted. with the department, department and their 40% and the school, school being a four years old at that point, took out a 60 million rand loan from the bank to pay for the 28 classrooms, our 60%. So I know lots of principals here thought that I got the money before from the department, no, I did not. Took a big risk. When you're a three-year-old school, you have no books, uh, as in uh, county books to show the bank why they should give you money. Uh, and uh, the only sort of uh, bartering or collab or whatever I had was my reputation as a principal and as a teacher that I would make this work. And so we got the loan and the problem had 10 million and we had 16 million and that was 26 million and we built 28 classrooms with the innovation center, etc. and so on. But the idea when we designed these classrooms, because now the school was in charge of it, we tried to design something different to create these learning spaces. So some of uh, the science labs we designed had dividers in them. And so you could open up the divider and have a double science lab. So in other words, I could have a teaching in the front of the lab while other kids were doing their practicals in the back of the lab. Or I could bring three or four classes in the lab and just do all the practicals at one shot. Those type of things. We designed uh, a little space, uh, which, also, which was a four-classroom space, which also could be divided up into four individual classrooms, or have a big four-classroom space. You could bring a whole grading, to do team teaching, uh, or to do collaboration, to do whatever you wanted to do with them, mini wall if you want to call it, um, but you could also divide it up into half or into quarters and create different types of, of spaces so that the kids uh, could work maybe in smaller groups if you needed to. Another thing I did which was work, but also didn't work, is instead of having classroom doors that were wooden and you couldn't see through and the teachers were closed and you don't know what the hell is going on behind the classroom, and I am an A personality. Um, I made sure the classroom was made of glass. So everybody could see what was happening in their classroom when you walk past. So the teachers freaked out initially because kids were going to be distracted and they were going to be distracted and others were going to. And you know, after about two weeks, everybody got over the novelty of having, having to see what was going in or out. And 
It allowed me as a principal and allowed other teachers to see best practice. So as you walk in other corners, you say, oh, this is looking good. Let me just stand here and see what's going on in this classroom. Um, and so we were able to collaborate more as staff uh, with the design of the classrooms. Recently, the WCD is building a school in Rivergate, um, just outside the noon area, and they've made the foundation-based classrooms look differently. The, there is a window, a long window, at the back of the classroom to shed light in the back of the classroom, so it's not this dark, dingy place at the back of the classroom. Every one of the foundation face problems are all low with table around the one side with nice cavity and a sink with a tap. Because the thinking is there, well, these little minis have to wash their hands because we know how it goes. And so then you have to send them out. There's a tap. We can wash things right here in the classroom. Um, so different thinking on, on how the design goes. Even things like where the plugs are had to be thought about. Where are we going to put plugs in a 21st century classroom? Because Kids nowadays, everybody needs to charge their cell phones. I remember saying to the, the architects, I don't know, guys, we need another 10 plugs in the back wall. Especially with the new high school. Just need plugs anyway, just put plugs in, because every child wants to charge their cell phone or laptop or something. So little things like that in design. And we at the WC are now calling this classroom by design. So believe it or not, I know we get a lot of flack here at the office at uh, WC, we are thinking about these things classroom by design. Schools by design. Just not putting up a school um, that looks like a prison. You know, you look at our old schools, I'm going to use Mrs. Mrs. Layman's building, the old building we have, like the classrooms uh, along the sides, with like a wall in the middle, and the noise is just crazy. I don't even know how you guys teach in that school. And then we have this, um, uh, at PHA as well, all the rainwater, instead of using cement, normal cement on, in the um, quads, we put semi permeable cement, slightly more expensive, built a reservoir under the school, because it was on 70 degree here, so it made itself. And in the reservoir, every single piece of rainwater is collected. Because as it falls in the quads, it goes through the cement into the, into the reservoir. Use that water to obviously water the grass, flush the toilets, etc. Um, Sun Exchange, and I'm sure some of your schools have heard about Sun Exchange, and if you haven't, get in contact with them. We put in solar panels on there. So what they do is they, they sell the solar panels on the open market. It's almost like crowdfunding, but they don't say that because they're very sensitive about it. So they say it's not crowdfunding, but it is crowdfunding. So you uh, get, uh, go into contact with them, they put the solar panels up, they sell the solar panels. So as a school, you have no capital outlay. But you can get, so not inverters and batteries, just the solar panels. So these combos will be still go off, but at least you've got solar panels. And you can save quite a bit of money on your, your electricity uh, bill because they sending the electricity back to you via the solar panels at a much cheaper rate. Also, you know that the, the, the increase for the next five years, the X percent, because you signed it in the contract. We work with ESCO, we never know, is it going to be 37% this year or whatever the increase is going to be? That makes budgeting difficult. So that's another innovative way of trying to bring some of the um, uh, you know, 21st century skills into your school. With the solar panels, when we were selling it on the open market, we actually made it part of the school's economics project. Where the kids actually bought the solar panels. And now they track the investment uh, that they get on their returns on the solar panels. So that can be part of what you do in your school. So 21st century skills. You don't need lots of stuff. You need to be agile, you need to think out of the box, and you need to create opportunities for your children to learn the skills they need. Movable furniture. So on the last slab, they start putting wheels. So I can move because in the lab there's a massive test. It's put wheels. You can just move them around. Because wheels don't cost much. It doesn't take a lot to put them on. You can get that done to make your classroom more, uh, more agile and have a desk in one spot. And I still don't understand. I've said to the head office, why are we ordering this old-fashioned furniture when we're talking 21st century classroom? So we're starting to move now also to spec new furniture at WCE, new designs of furniture, like something different. If you need a, at a primary school, you need some ideas, go to Hillsdale Primary School. Uh, that principal and staff made their own furniture with their own hands. So it's custom design. You can move it around, make different things. You'd be blown away what they've done. And obviously, that didn't cost that much because they did it themselves uh, with their parents. So go and take a look. There's lots of schools out there that have got different thinking in their design. Campus of schools, it's a new idea as well that we're coming up with. And we've just started that with, um, at Saxon Sea and at Rosendale. We've heard of the Rapid Build project that the minister talks about. And so we have a Rapid Build and we have a junior high school 
on the next door land at Rosendahl, which will have seven, uh, grade sixes at the moment, I mean, grade, not grade sixes, grade eights at the moment, and then obviously grade nines next year, and we're hoping that in the future we'll have seven, eights, and nines, because that's a phase, and they must be together, because the grade sevens are in primary school, but they must carry on into grade eights, and maybe they should rather be with the eights and nines together uh, in, their, say, in their phase, so those teachers can talk to each other, and we can get our masses off them. And I'm reading better. Um, and that's a rat and pull project which is made a complete different type of design and building using um, steel infrastructure and filling it up uh, with a more uh, cheap material. And it, we built nine classrooms, and I'm right, this is when I get wrong, this is later, nine classrooms plus a four classroom in space which can be subdivided, the innovation centers, so it's about 12 classrooms, uh, admin block, a staff room, and toilets in 65 days. Okay, but that's thanks to that coming body because they keep the gangsters at bay and the mafia. But they managed to do it in 65 days. And it's actually seen in Atlantis. So there are lots of innovation. We are trying as WCB to innovate uh, within obviously the budget uh, to get different types of learning spaces. So the idea at Rosendahl with the um, innovation center and the way the classrooms are designed is that a teacher could have a class in a 60 square meter classroom but then stream her lessons into the big space where another four, five, six classrooms can be with maybe one teacher and a couple of um, assistants. You could have an expert teacher teaching instead of having an expert teacher teaching 50 learners here and the other 150 being taught by whoever you can find because you have to fill your posts. There's lots of different ways um, of thinking. Um, and so the rapid school bills that we're talking about we are also looking at WCE, we are looking at old office blocks and redesigning them into schools. Not the schools we know, because we need to innovate. So they're not going to offer all the thousands of sports and 20, 100 subjects. Those offer a certain stream of subjects. They will be completely different in how we design them, how we run them, their codes of conduct, things like that. Okay, so it's a very exciting time to be in education. And I ask the principals that are here, uh, the North know, because I've been talking to them all the time about this, that if we come to you, put that away and say me, because yes, it's going to be a disaster, it's going to be chaos, it's going to make your head gray, and you are going to get uh, sleepless nights and maybe some heart palpitations. I walk around my office saying something about having a stroke, because you've got all these different designs of classrooms, and I'm not sure if they're going to work. Uh, I keep telling Mr. Layman it is going to work. But sometimes I'm not sure. Uh, but we have to try. Because if we don't try something new, we're never going to get our kids when we need them uh, in terms of what they require in this global world. Um, so, just to end off, uh, designing a classroom for 21st century is not decorating. Okay? It's an actual putting thought into how I can create different learning spaces for collaboration, creativity. Um, and whatever other skills I need to teach my children and to give them the personalized, as best I can, without ICT. How can I personalize the education for them within my classroom? Something I saw when I um, went to America, one of the ETA, uh, what the prize was to go with the DG to the United States, it was really interesting. But besides that, one of the schools has, has a classroom and both the classroom classrooms of quad. Quad is closed and the walls of the quad are whiteboards. The whole thing is whiteboards. So when they send the kids out, the kids can collaboratively work on these whiteboards together. And they've got like a little seating around it. The, the one's called the IT lab. We put our IT labs with the two computers facing each other and the kids sit like in rows. This one, and I've tried this design and it did have its pros and cons, where the kids are facing that way. The, you as a teacher, your desk is here, so you can see every screen as you stand here up on a platform. Kids don't need to see who you're teaching uh, IT or CAT. They need to see what's on the whiteboard. And you need to see what they are, they are doing because they are on Facebook. <laughs> TikTok, while you're teaching, you think it's going well, but nothing's going well. But if I can see everybody's screen, just at a glance of our stagger it, I can see exactly what they're doing while I'm standing here at my desk teaching. It's a classroom by design for 21st century skills. And so I'm just going to leave you with those few ideas. I hope you stimulate some thinking. I haven't given you answers. I don't have mobiles. I don't have posts. Um, but I hope at least what you're thinking. Thank you.
that amazing talk. Uh, I think I speak for everyone when I say that it was so informative. I've learned so much. And as a foundation phase teacher myself, it really resonated with me, being agile, turning spaces into practical learning spaces, and, um, and I definitely agree about the decorating versus <laughs> walls need to be places of learning. So without further ado, I think I need to um, introduce you to our panelists, um, who are uh, the experts, uh, being those at the coal face, so first of all, could I introduce you to Katri Haman, who is the principal of Cult Sien Primary. And then Marshall Cupido, who is the principal of Silver Sands Primary School. And Stanley Ives from Bridgeville Primary. And lastly, Granville Swartz from Heathfield Primary School. Teaching has involved, it's not like we were taught 
or not even me, uh, the grandparents and the before fathers being taught in rows. Life changed and our kids in front of our classes has also moved on and we must be cognitive about that. Then, everything in your school can be wow. It doesn't need to have an excuse of there's no money. I'm a no free school. I'm going to sell four women. No? Don't have anything from the parents. We give everything, but we make it work. We need to be wow. And that's where the hustle comes in. So that was very, very nice um, thing that she said. And then, last thing, skill, or second last thing, skills driven. Um, Yes, the curriculum says A, B, and C, but we must remember what we want to send out in the world. Um, we want to send kids out to be grown-ups, to have, to have sustainability, to, to, to be, to have their place under the sun. And sometimes we must focus more on the skills than the content. Remember, although we are not all in classes anymore, your school is a class. So manage it like a classroom. Use your spaces that you have. And then the keynote that I've taken from, from her presentation is think out of the box.
but you as the leaders should be driving it. So, like uh, Pais, my, my colleague, uh, said, uh, said you know, previously, we were part of the, 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 the group that graduated, graduated last year or this year, um, that the enthusiasm to be at the school every morning should not be broken down by things that is happening in the classroom, in the school, and in the store. You should be there irrespective of the one that is wanting you not to be there. So you are there for the other one, the one that is also like hard working, enthusiastic to become or to be there in the morning with you. And if you have a team like that, or a team that you're building up to be there, then you're on the right path. You have been placed there with a reason. And that reason is to be for the learner, to be for the community, and to be successful at the end of the day. So yeah, that's my part of, of uh, my story. When I've seen Protea Heights, I've been there for a workshop, and what you're speaking about is 100% true. If you can one day go to that side, please go and see what you have put in place. And if that is the ideas that the department have, then we go that way. Um, I just recently, uh, a month ago, we have installed a solar system, another solar inverter system for the admin block. And you know what the negative is? Sir, you have spent so much money, but the network is off. <laughs> so now I'm asking, what next? Why did you come up with an idea? Why did you run with an idea? We are there to support this idea, not to break this idea. So I wish you well for the year here. I've said to myself, 2023 is going to be a good year, but I started off on a negative foot. A negative foot, and I'm not going to turn that into a negative. I am positive looking forward. It will be a best year, ever for us. So I thank you. Thank you. Teaching them to be 
become proactive as well. And that will be to the point of proactive. Being proactive, we can't wait, as um, Kat has indicated in my um, marshal as well. We can't wait on people, we can't wait on the department. We must make things happen. And this is where you draw in the sense of your colleagues as well around you. I always tell them, your biggest resource around you is your colleagues. The expertise, the experience, draw from, learn from one another, and seek out if you need it. And uh, from there, obviously, we can make things better. But if you're going to get caught up in a situation where you don't speak, don't talk, you will have bigger problems later. Then, um, to be agile and uh, flexible and to make things happen. For example, we needed some great three tables, the size for the learning was the in between there. So I told my staff, let's have a look at it, my deputy and caretakers, and we all need to cut down tables to the size for the, you know, I'm not going to wait in the department or anybody else for that matter. We must make things happen. Otherwise, it's never going to be done. And then, obviously, the last one is don't be afraid to fail. Um, we are fallible, and I always say that. We all make mistakes, but we must learn from them. And one of the biggest things, obviously, as a leader, you should be able to identify and give credence to the fact that if you made a mistake, you have to make amends. So if you make a mistake, own up to it. And then you get the things in place. The same too with your staff members. They need to learn this too because many of them make mistakes in classrooms. And what do they teach the learners at the end of the day? How to make an right what you've done wrong. Um, I like to say by a little friend of mine, Simon Ben, I think most people know him, educationist. And he says, it doesn't matter about the ICT or the best resource you have in your school. The person that makes the difference is the teaching class. So we must ensure that we get the best for our teachers for empowerment, development. So that they can be the best of the dance in the class again. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, colleagues. Brian Moldswat, Hayfield Primary. Wendy, thanks for this very energetic um, presentation and just enthusing us. And I think um, if we have those type of energies in all our districts all the time, I think um, there will be more coming out of our different schools. So I guess everybody will leave here and call GTT, what, what is it? Um, chat, chat, um, what does hustle mean? Define hustle. But I think that is one of, for any principal working in under-resourced schools, those are one of, that is part, I think for those of us that was a new at Temple of those, those were one of those courses, part of the hidden curriculum. Because you cannot survive any under resource school without having that skill. And I think there's other terms that we would use, collaborate. Um, we will use things like partner, we will, we will, we will use words like consult. Um, and sometimes we'll go right down and say we beg and we grovel, but we will get the things to our learners and our schools. And sometimes we sometimes think that that only lies with the principal now, teachers, parents. And I was asked, how does all of this impact that we will speak about our school? And I will use a couple of examples. Um, we currently are the proud owners of what used to be UCT soccer artificial turfs. Um, and that was a pride of joy. And you'll even find when our model C schools from other side, the, the Burnfield area comes to Eatfield, they want to come and play cricket because at our school, because we've got this beautiful facility. And I can just tell you this, principles, you know, when you have these beautiful facilities like that, I suddenly realize why many times we don't have those things in our under resourced schools, because I was suddenly wondering, how do we maintain this? And then WCD for once was like the city they were for us. <laughs> um, they, um, again, uh, they came last year and said, we're going to have a fully refurbished school with it. So, and the and part that I just want to put before I forget, they promise that we will have a school that will be future-proof. Uh, you're going to have to evaluate as things go um, by what future-proof means in real terms of things. But with this, when I was sort of worrying about our turf and it's well used by all those of you that played soccer up at UCT on that turf, um, it's well used and it was busy coming um, loose at the edges and how do I budget 
in a phantom budget to get this thing maintained. And then the department came up with this brilliant, must be an answer to my prayers and said, Mrs. Swartz, if we save three months of um, basically seeing to preparing a ground for the mobiles, we can save that. The condition is we're going to give you a brand new turf. I said, yes, Lord, thank you. Um, so, so that comes, number one, a parent hustle there. A parent worked and removed it, the said UCT, and he begged and came back to my predecessor and um, said, can I organize this for the school? So it's not our all tasking, it doesn't always have to be in, on our desk. Then besides the teachers, give you an idea, we now recently had a circle and with petrol and all of those bus prices just went away. And one of my PIY interns came and he said, sir, can I organize the buses? And he got the buses for half the price. So always think about, speak to, and always allow those to do the hustling. Our governing body chairperson, um, we were talking about, we still had told two years ago, and I worked with William at my pre school at Harmony, William and I packed out what is a pretty odd computer and he connected a complete lab when he was still with Kanya. So we still had, at my current school, almost 20 years old, Kanya PCs. It was well looked after, and they were so slow, they didn't connect. Um, we struggled to get to MCL. And we kept on putting it out there. And one day I just got a call from our governing body chief person. I spoke to somebody that presented at our company today. Can he come and meet you? Three months later, we had uh, half a million rand, fully refurbished computer lab. So if we want to get into, and I'm just thinking earlier on, we cannot talk about 21st century skills, classroom, school, without linking to that, the fourth industrial revolution, because that will be the vehicle of getting our kids, our learners, into that space. Um, another project that I was, to get a call, and, and this is what I want to just tell you, colleagues, when you collaborate, please, please report to your funders, report to those people, and give them report facts, invite them to things, because um, at the end of the day, the more you work with them, the more you speak to them, the more they're going to come back and spend more money or give more resources at your school. If we come too busy to do new diligence, they walk away and they go to somebody that they feel will do better. So I get a call um, from a partner that I work with in another district. Formerly I worked in Central um, at Norman Primary. And they said, look, I tried everything. I cannot just get the principal on the same day, on the same time, my partner has money to spend. See, you know, the CSI money, there's BE, but it is ICT specific that you want to spend it. Three days later, um, at that time, 45,000 Rand was paid into our account, based only for ICT, and we could develop that. Um, going, going forward in terms of what we're doing and developing spaces, I always believed in that in technology, I always, I think, I saw Leonard up there. Remember how we were putting computers at the Georgia Primary together and um, recreating um, a little bit of ICT for teachers, and that was a million years ago, Leonard. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Um, but at school, what we've done is we took, besides the computers that we had, we took the 20 um, mini slim lab computers, we put it in a room where our library is, and we split the room in two. Now, always time on toss is a big thing. So we said, oh, our learners I only have 20 computers. So what we did is we timetabled those learners two periods in that classroom. So one period off, have library. We use the library as a vehicle to drive um, remedial reading. And our other half do MCO maths. Then they split the rounds. So we save time, and we use a venue effectively, and that is, I think, some of the creativity that um, we need alluded to. Um, at school, also, just been very crazy, we created an outdoor classroom. So many times teachers could take for science the kids out to the outdoor classroom. Now, the slight challenge now is we in mobiles, they're very hot mobiles. Um, they handed over to us on the 16th of Jan, we were operational already on the on the 18th when our learners arrive. So all these things, principles, when we ask, it's more than just 
getting things is how you apply what you get, is how we manage those things. I mean, I can continue for quite a long time talk, telling you and talking you about things that we implemented and how we applied it at our school. And ultimately, it is for the best, as to the best interests of our learners and to improve teaching and learning for all our learners. Thank you.